what's up everyone welcome back to another review and this time i'm going to be doing a re-review of batman begins the first installment into christopher nolan's dark knight trilogy now i had originally reviewed the dark knight trilogy before on this channel i am not satisfied with those reviews as i think they're just not that great and i don't think they fully and uh, I, I don't think they fully capture my overall thoughts on how i feel about this uh, trilogy of movies so the entire purpose of these of these re-reviews is to give my undisputed thoughts on probably the second best superhero trilogy out there. So without any further ado, let's talk about Batman Begins. So my overall feelings on Batman Begins is as this. I think this movie did a really good job at pretty much rebooting the character of Batman in a 2005 context. What Christopher Nolan and David S. Goyer did was pretty much take the 1939 Batman and, and pretty much dropped him in a 2005 aesthetic, giving him moder a modern update. And for the most part, I think it translates very well, very well to screen. What, what Nolan did was pretty much strip away a lot of the fantastical elements to Batman, and he made him more grounded and more realistic. Now, for a first movie, I get it, I understand it, and it works. I also think this handicapped Nolan later on when you get to movies like The Dark Knight, but more specifically Batman, but, but, more, but more specifically Dark Knight Rises. And when I eventually get to Dark Knight Rises, I'll, I'll go into more detail about that. But for the confines of Batman Begins, Nolan did a great job at telling a, car a, at telling a story that deep dives into the psychology of Bruce Wayne, and we see his transformation from, from the billionaire uh, heir from heir apparent to the Wayne Matt to, to the Wayne throne to the dark vigilante protector of bat of Gotham known as the Batman <clears throat> and from start to finish I overall think Nolan did a really good job with this movie this the Batman Begins was that first superhero movie to pretty much take the concept of a superhero and pretty much make it mature and make it more for a more adult audience by telling a very adult and more or less human story to the character and I think Nolan as a director is has Nolan as a director has always been fantastic. Now prior to doing Batman Begins, he was not known for doing these, you know, superhero temple movies. So when you watch Batman Begins for the first time, you know, a lot of the action sequences can be a little janky in some areas, not really well choreographed, but there's also some action sequences that I actually think are really good. Uh, some of my favorite action sequences are pretty much the, is the more or less the training montage between Bruce and Ra's al Ghul. I think those are the better directed action sequences. And you got some sequences peppered all throughout when, when Bruce is in Batman mode, like when his, like his first real appearance when he's taking out thugs at a dock. And then there's this one scene when he's in an abandoned hotel where he gets sprayed by fear toxin. <clears throat> like, I think a lot of those scenes are actually really well handled and very well directed. But then you get some scenes where it's just riddled with shaky cam and it just does not look good whatsoever. <clears throat> but, the overall, but in terms of overall action highlights and set pieces, the tumbler chase scene towards the middle, towards the third act of the movie where, where the cops are chasing Batman all over Gotham, that action set piece is actually the best action sec sequence in the entire movie. It has a lot of just dark underlined humor to it. It's very, it's paced very, very well. It has a good, it has a good ticking time bomb aesthetic to it as Batman is trying to get Rachel to Alfred before she succumbs to the fear toxin that Scarecrow has sprayed her with. So I like the tumble chase. The tumble chase to me still holds up. And what also still holds up is the fact that Nolan did this movie with very minimal CG. He kept it mostly practical and it looks great 20 years later. Like this movie really, this movie still holds up 20 years later. And when you compare it to more, to, to the more modern day movies, this movie blows this movie blows those movies out of the water and I dare anyone to prove me wrong. <clears throat> Nolan took the time to craft his sequences with with practical effects on on location shooting and it gives the movie just a it gives this movie a more realistic feel when you do that. It doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like you're watching a video game. It feels like you're watching a real movie because the locations feel real the lack of CG and the use of practical make the movie feel like it could happen at, at, make the make this movie feel like it could happen in the real world I appreciate that that's where the grounded aesthetic of Nolan's take on Batman really works because it feels like it, it this movie feels like it could happen it feels like there could be a Batman in Manhattan so to speak so I like all that stuff that stuff to me works <clears throat> uh, in terms of, of this movie's casting 
Nolan spared no expense when it came to the casting of this movie. He went out and got the best possible talent. Of course, what can you say about Christian Bale's portrayal as Batman that has not been said before? Honestly, truthfully, I think his performance in Batman Begins is actually better as as it is actually better in this movie than how it is in Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises. <clears throat> not in terms of his overall, not in terms of how Batman is portrayed as a physical fighter, but in terms of how he's portrayed as a more intimidating presence. Mm, excuse me. One of the main criticisms aimed at Christian Bale was how he did the Batman voice. Uh, especially when you watch Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises, the voice sounds very forced. It sounds just like he's trying too hard to be intimidating. I think Begins is where Bale, he got the voice right the first time, and I don't know why they, they felt the need to change it up in the, in the later movies. It felt more natural. What made, <clears throat> what makes Batman work as, a, as an intimidating presence is that he just lowers his real voice into a more into a more into a more uh, monotone into a more monotone and deeper uh, representation of what his voice really is uh, a good example of that is kevin conroy from the batman animated series and michael keaton from the 89 movies they basically just took their real voices and dropped it down to a more deeper tone hence why you get the a more intimidating presence christian bale he did that with this movie and for the most part it worked i mean yeah he still got he, he still has some of that graveliness to it but it doesn't sound as hammy, unintentionally comedic as it is in Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises, where he's trying so hard and he really sounds like this. Like he like someone punched him in the gut and he lost all his breath. Uh so yeah, in terms of Batman as a physical threat, I actually think he's much more physically imposing in Batman Begins. I just I like the overall I like I like the modern update of the Batsuit. It is a has a more tactical army aesthetic to it. And that goes into the more realism that Nolan went with this movie. And of course, a lot of that has to do with Morgan Freeman's character of Lucius Fox pretty much being the one who gives Batman his technology, which I really like. And, uh, and, and, and it's Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman's a fantastic actor, and I like him in this movie. He and Christian Bell have really good chemistry. A lot of the movie's comedy comes from the interactions of Bruce Wayne and Lucius Fox. Well, Lucius Fox pretty much not buying the stories that Bruce is giving him as opposed to why he wants all this gear. <laughs> So I like that stuff. That stuff is actually really well done, very well handled. <clears throat> but I digress. So yeah, in terms of Christian Bale's performance as Batman, I like it. When he's in the fight scenes, for the most part, he handles himself really well. I ain't gonna blame Christian Bale for not, for the fight scenes. I handle more of that to Nolan, not really being refined and direct in these kind of action sequences. Uh, of course, when you watch Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises, he gets much, much better in terms of how he choreographs his action. But for a first timer, it is what it is. It it is mostly done in close-ups with a lot of shaky cam, and it and it can look very amateur in a lot of areas. But that's just that's just it is what it is. In the hands of a lesser director, it could have looked much much worse. But since Nolan is very capable, he managed to do what he can with his limited experience in directing action sequences, and it looks fine for the most part. And Christian Bale does look good in the overall suit, and does look good in handling those scenes. <clears throat> So while I, I know, while I like Christian Bale as Batman, where Bale really signs is when he's Bruce Wayne. And this was the first movie to really emphasize the billionaire playboy aspect of the Bruce Wayne character. And I think, even though I think now, I think Christian, Christian Bale is one of the better actors to have a good balance of Bruce Wayne and a good balance of Batman. <clears throat> he's able to take the cocky arrogance of Bruce Wayne and play it up as somebody who's just putting on an act. and. And it works. It really, really, it works. It works a lot. Like, I like Christian Bale as Batman. He plays him as very pompous and very arrogant. Though we all know that is, but though the characters, though though his close, though the close people, that, though his close inner circle know that it's just a front, that he has to put on this act as a way to avoid being, as a way to avoid suspicion. I like that stuff. I think it works. A lot of his chemistry with a lot of, with a lot of, with a lot of these supporting actors really works as well. I already mentioned, I like the scenes with him and Morgan, with him and Morgan Freeman. Michael Caine as Alfred. <clears throat> Michael Caine as Alfred is inspired casting. I love Michael Caine's performance as Alfred. This is an Alfred who, unlike, who is no disrespect to Michael Goh. Because I think Michael Goh's Alfred in the Burton Schumacher movies is an iconic portrayal and legendary. But Michael Goh's Alfred was more fatherly and more, had more warmth to him. Uh, Michael Caine's Alfred has that as well, but he's also not afraid to strike back at Bruce when he feels Bruce is tiptoeing the line and going over the line. He ain't afraid to put Bruce in his place and give Bruce a talking down to if need be. 
That's why I think Michael Caine's outfit has that nice balance of warmth, but also sternness. <clears throat> and a lot of the scenes of Michael Caine and Christian Bale, again, like the scenes with Morgan Freeman and Christian Bale, there's some of the best scenes in the movie and really, and you really get to see some good, as and, you, and you get some good moments and good aspects of both those characters. And like, like Michael Caine's outfit really comes across as a surrogate father to Bruce. There's a lot of love there, but also a lot of just, <clears throat> but also a lot of just a listen. You know, if you're gonna do this, you gotta do. You got you're gonna have to put up some fronts. Like I like how it's Alfred that inspires Bruce to to pretty much create the double life that he has. <clears throat> That's good stuff. I like it a lot. I think one of the I think one of the movie's biggest flaws. Well, I'm not gonna say biggest flaws. It's, it's, I think biggest opportunity is that it didn't do enough. It's that we didn't get enough scenes of Alfred and Lucius Fox talking to Bruce together. I think you could have gotten some good. I think you could have gotten some good mileage out of that. <clears throat> like you basically got Batman's two closest allies and Lucius and my, and Alfred they have one scene together as a trio but they but they barely share any dialogue together that was a big missed opportunity with this first movie <clears throat> and I think if you would have had more scenes like that it would have heightened up the three relationships together and I just want to see Morgan Freeman and Michael Caine interact with with, with each other as Lucius and Alfred because there's this underlying because in the one scene that they have, you can tell that, that, that they have a history with one another, and I would like to have seen that explored just a little bit. <clears throat> but that's just a personal gripe. <clears throat> that's just a personal gripe that I have. Now, aside from who I consider, now, aside from those three, you have Gary Oldman as Commissioner Gordon. I think Gary Oldman as Commissioner Gordon was fantastic. Unlike Pat Hingle, who was grossly underutilized as Gordon, you got the most you got out of you got the most you got out of you got the most out of Gordon in this movie. He's active in the plot. He teams up with Batman at various points in the movie. He has he plays a big role in the climax where he helps Batman throw it off Ray Shal Ghul from destroying Gotham City. <clears throat> and we re and I like the fact that we get to see Gordon interact with a young Bruce Wayne after his parents died, which gives a more deeper connection to the characters of Bruce and, and of, of uh, Bruce and Gordon and why these two value each other as very close allies. Like we get all that in this first movie. At first, it starts off as adversarial, naturally, because Batman's a vigilante, so you don't know what he, so you don't know what he's, you don't know what his goals are and his endgame is. But as the movie progresses, we see Gordon slowly start to put his trust into Batman because he knows what Batman's all about, and he knows that Batman's about putting the city first and not and not everything else after it. It's about, it's about putting the city first and trying to bring and trying to instill a sense of inspiration into Gotham, which is a city that is just rot with just corruption and crime. <clears throat> and Gordon is one of the few cops who is honest and when he has a powerful ally in Batman, this is this is the this pretty much is the first steps into building Gotham as being incorruptible. <clears throat> so I like all that. You get all that in this first movie and it gets and it gets beautifully expanded upon in its in the later sequels, <clears throat> for better or worse in some aspects and how you want to view it. But for the context it begins, can't say enough good things about Gary Oldman's Commissioner Gordon. He's great. I love the interactions that he has with, uh, with the character of Flash, played by Mark Bourne Jr. I think they have some good scenes together. I would like to see more of it. I think one of the, another missed opportunity with this movie is that we really didn't get to see a whole lot of the police corruption that Gordon has to fight off. I think that I mean when you watch a movie like Batman Year One, which is an animated movie, which is only an hour, <clears throat> that movie was able that animated movie was able to explore Gordon's fight against the Gotham City against the Gotham City police and the corruption that pollutes it. I mean, we get the we get you know we get you no know, we do get some of that in this movie, but we, it's not fully explored, which I think was a missed opportunity because it could have played a lot into Gordon's character and his and his eventual promotion to commissioner in Dark in the Dark Knight. And I just wanted to see more scenes of Gordon and and Flask having their, you know, conflicting theories but heads. Like Gordon is the honest cop and Flash is the dirty cop who wants Gordon to who wants Gordon to get in on it, but Gordon is sticking to his morals and doesn't want to doesn't want to cross that line. You could have done a lot more with that <clears throat> instead of what we got in this movie, which is more or less face value. And I think that was a missed opportunity to really deep dive more into the police corruption within Gotham, as opposed to the whole cities and, to, and as opposed to the overall in terms, in terms of the overall aesthetic of the city itself being corrupted, we could have gotten more of those little things, like like Gordon having to fight, having to fight, having to rise the ranks in a dirty police force. Even though we, you have Commissioner Loeb, who unlike his comic book counterpart, is mostly an honest cop. 
you know that's another thing Loeb was kind of underutilized in this movie in this movie as well like if you're gonna do a more honest version of Commissioner Loeb at least have him and Gordon team up to fight the corruption within the within the Gotham PD even though Loeb is commissioner he still is powerless to take down corruption but at least with Gordon he has a he has an ally that is not afraid to stand up with him we don't get any of that in this movie uh, Commissioner Loeb more or less just comes off as just an adversary in a way to Batman but not in a way that where he's trying to like you know but in a way where he's just trying to bring balance to his city so to speak <clears throat> so yeah I think Commissioner Loeb as I think the reinvention of Commissioner Loeb as more or less a good cop is kind of a waste in my opinion and you could have done so much more with Gordon fighting off a dirty police department in this movie as well but at least we at least that idea gets expanded upon in the dark knight so i can't hate it too much but at least the groundwork was laid out in this movie <clears throat> um you have uh, uh you have katie holmes as the character of rachel dawes uh, the character of rachel dawes more or less is a love interest to bruce wayne their childhood friends <clears throat> uh, i think katie holmes she's fine in the role like i don't think she's great i don't think she's bad either her and christian bell have decent on-screen chemistry though i do think there are some scenes where katie holmes acting could be a little bit wooden in some areas and then there are other as and then there are other areas where her acting can be pretty decent. This is one instance where I think Maggie Gyllenhaal did a much better job playing the character of Rachel Dawes, and kind of makes me wish that Maggie Gyllenhaal was cast from as Rachel Dawes from the get go, mainly because I thought Maggie and Bale had better on screen chemistry in The Dark Knight. But that's just me personally. That's how I feel about all. That's how I feel. Uh, in terms of Liam Neeson who's the villain in this movie, I thought Liam Neeson did a fantastic job playing the character of Ra's al Ghul. Uh, I wish Nolan did not kill off the character of Ra's al, of Ra's al Ghul. I wish, that we I wish Nolan would have still kept that tease of maybe Ra's al Ghul having a supernatural element to him or having his staple immortality to him. But when you watch this movie, yeah, Ra's is dead. There, the League of, there is no Lazarus Pit in the Nolan verse. And we and we pretty much found that out <coughs> as in the subsequent movies that followed this one. But in terms of how Liam Neeson played the character Rachel Gould, I love the idea of Raish Al Ghul being the mentor to Bruce Wayne and the League of Shadows <coughs> being the ones who trained Bruce Wayne and pretty much gave him every all the techniques he learned and and he applied that to when he came became came to got came went back to Gotham and became Batman. That all goes back to Rachel to him being under the learning tree of Rachel Ghoul and the League of Shadows. But like the comic books, Rachel Ghoul wants to enlist Batman into the League of Shadows so that way they can fight corruption. But the only way to fight corruption is to pretty much just destroy everything and rebuild it back up. Of course, <clears throat> that ideology conflicts with Bruce Wayne's. Bruce Wayne's ideology is not to destroy everything. His ideology is to inspire those to fight against something, not kill against something. And that's where the conflicting ideology between Rachel Ghoul and Bruce Wayne come into, pretty much is the main focal point of this movie. And I like it. You have the student going against his mentor, and it pays off in a very good climax. <clears throat> and I think Liam Neeson and Christian Bale have outstanding chemistry. Good stuff. <clears throat> now we get to an aspect of the movie now we get to an aspect of the movie that I thought was really on paper had so much potential but an execution is handicapped by Christopher Nolan's grounded aesthetic and that is the character of Scarecrow so I will say this Killian Murphy and his performance I think is really good he has a very just he has a very eerie quality to him as Jonathan Crane slash Scarecrow and I like the effect that he has a scarecrow and the use of his fear toxin uh the best scene <clears throat> is when he has is where he has carmine falcone <clears throat> inside arkham asylum and he uses his spray toxin against him now carmine falcone he's more or less the third villain of this movie um he doesn't uh, like carmine falcone his character pretty much inspires bruce wayne to want to go out into the world and train and hone and hone his senses <clears throat> So that is that, that that's that that's what that what that is, and that's pretty much the extent of Carmine Falcone's uh, overall uh, importance to the plot. He's basically a pawn in the Ra's al Ghul chess game, just like just like Scarecrow is. <clears throat> but let me get back to Scarecrow, and get my point across. Killian Murphy's 
Killian, Ur Killian Murphy's first initial appearances as Scarecrow, I thought were actually very, very well done and very, very creepy, very, very eerie, and really, and really utilize what the Scarecrow is all about, which is using his fear toxin to get into your head and to turn your greatest fears against you. His first initial scenes, I thought were great. Killian Murphy had that right amount of creepiness and just that right amount of intim intimidation factor. Even though you don't know, even though you will never notice it because Jonathan Crane is a very unassuming man, but once he puts the mask on and once he sprays you with his, with his, hallucinog with his hallucinogenics, you really get the sense of the threat and hit of him psychologically ripping your mind apart. I love that stuff. Now what does not work for me is how Scarecrow was eventually handled. I think this... <clears throat> so the whole premise of Batman Begins is fear and overcoming your fears and how you deal with fears, which is why Scarecrow, I think Ra's al Ghul should have not been the overall main villain of Batman Begins. I think Ra's al Ghul should have been more of an undermined villain that grew as the trilogy went on. And this movie should be more singularly focused on Scarecrow as the primary villain, since fear is the primarily is the primary story, is the driving factor and theme of this movie. How they handle Scarecrow towards the end of the movie, where he just gets bitched out by Rachel Dawes, and you don't see him again while he's riding on a horse, it was very underwhelming. And you didn't even come close to scratching the surface with Scarecrow and what he can really do when his fear toxin spreads all over Gotham. And Scarecrow has not done any good when you get to the two sequels, because he comes across basically as a glorified cameo with no substantial, with no substantial impact into the plots of any of those two movies. The only time Scarecrow was done, which I guess you could say right in the Nolanverse, was in Batman Begins. But even then, even then he was grossly underutilized. Not a big fan of that. Another thing I'm not a fan of is that Rachel Dawes is working with a man called Finch, who is the district attorney of Gotham. And there's a scene where Finch is executed and killed by the League of Shadows. I'm cool with that. I think this movie, towards the end, should have introduced us to the character of Harvey Dent and his ascension to Gotham DA, which would have, which would have bled right into the Dark Knight. You know, establish Harvey Dent early on in this movie so that way when we get to Dark Knight you don't have to cover so much groundwork with him and you, we can get and we can get to his, his eventual <clears throat> like Batman Begins should have been Harvey Dent's rise as DA and the Dark Knight should have been his eventual fall gradual fall basically is what I'm trying to get at that's another that's another aspect of the movie that I thought was kind of missing was that is that Harvey Dent should have been introduced much, much earlier. When you watch these movies in context, Harvey Dent should have appeared, should have appeared in Batman Begins, and not, uh, and you should not have waited till The Dark Knight to introduce him. I think that was a uh, omission that should have not been omitted, in my opinion. <clears throat> but yeah, despite despite all the, the mixed bag of good and, and of of uh, positives and negatives, I overall really do enjoy Batman Begins. This movie has a lot more good than it has a lot more bad. I mean, <clears throat> you have a nice little story, you have a nice little subplot with this character of Mr. Earl, played by Rudger Hauer, who's trying to gain control of Wayne Enterprises to the point, <clears throat> excuse me, to the point where he hires Lucius Fox. But eventually, Batman get, eventually Bruce Wayne gets his power back and eliminates Earl from the equation. You know, I like Rudger Hauer, great actor, and I like the little role he had in this movie. I think it would have been, I think it would have been much more interesting if Rudger Hauer was actually Hugo Strange in disguise. Again, you're playing with the whole notion of fear and going and psychological breakdowns. How cool would it have been if Rudger Hauer was Hugo Strange in disguise? And, and, and I mean, it would have been Arkham City done like years earlier with Ra's al Ghul and Hugo Strange teaming up to pretty much break down Batman. That, I think that could have been, I mean, if you would have like wrote it in a way where it made sense, I think it could have been pretty cool. That's just me personally. I think I I think Rudger Howe would have made a very interesting Hugo Strange, if that were to, if that were to happen in this universe. <clears throat> uh, it's actually pretty strange that uh, Nolan never brought in Hugo Strange into these movies. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, because Hugo Strange is a character that could work in a grounded in, in a grounded Batman movie. <clears throat> but I digress. <clears throat> so with all that, so again, with all that being said. I think Batman Begins is actually a very good uh, re reintroduction to the Batman character from the tooth from a 2005 aesthetic. It brought the character back to its darker roost. It 
Roots. It's a movie that is star studded with incredible cast and outstanding director in Christopher Nolan. Some of the action set pieces, some are very good and some are very middling with the best one being the tumbler chase. <clears throat> I like the overall look and aesthetic of this world. It has a very gritty and grimy, grungy look to it. And Nolan's able to counter about and, and Nolan was able to counter that with a Gotham that on the surface level looks very pristine. But when you go underneath the belly of that beast, it's very run down. It's very just desolate. It's almost like a wasteland <clears throat> that's in desperate need of somebody stepping up to try and save these people who are forced to live in who are forced to live in a city that just wants to destroy them. I, I like that stuff. That plays into Batman when you look at it, because Batman's all about making wanting to make Gotham a better place. And it starts by rooting out all the negative energy that pollutes Gotham. <clears throat> so I like that stuff. And I also like the end where Gordon and Batman meet on the rooftop and it teases the Joker, which we eventually get with the Dark Knight. So I got no complaints when it comes to that. <clears throat> so as an overall grade, my grade for Batman Begins is pretty much going to stand as an 8 out of 10. This is a very good reintroduction to the Batman character. I would have did things maybe a little bit differently, but as an overall package, I thought Nolan did a great job at pretty much doing a modern update of the Batman character for a 2005 aesthetic. Got a great cast. Christian Bale is awesome as Batman and as Bruce Wayne. You have a very good villain in Liam Neeson's Ra's al Ghul. I personally would prefer Ra's al Ghul be more of his counterpart counterpart but i do like the i but i do like the grounded idea of racial of racial goal using decoys hence the cameo by ken watanabe in this movie who whose character more closely resembles race from the comic books but i like the effect but i like but i kind of like the mod by i like the idea of race using using decoys to pretty much make to pretty much act as the immortality of racial goal and the more modern unit and this more modern update <clears throat> But yeah, 8 out of 10 for Batman Begins. Let me know your thoughts in the comment sections down below. Like the video and subscribe, and I'll check you back next time for more. So just to make a brief little add-on that I forgot to mention, which is ridiculous because it's the overall crux of the third act. Uh, it's brought to the attention of Mr. Earl, the Rudger Hara character, that a microwave emitter has been stolen from Wayne Enterprises. Now this MacGuffin plays a heavy role into the third act of the movie because Ra's al Ghul and the Scarecrow are going to use this microwave emitter to vaporize the Gotham City water supply, plunging the and plunging the city into into just fear and watch it rip itself apart. This plays a big role in the plan of Ra's al Ghul because this is how he's going to tear Gotham in half with this microwave emitter. Um, I like the heightened science of the microwave emitter. Like it's something that feels heightened and unrealistic, but realistically can happen if the technology is advanced enough to make something like this happen. So I, so you do get some of that fantastical element, though it's done in a very grounded way, and it has a very grounded explanation to, the, to where you watch it, you're like, hey, you know, something like this can work in real world, in the real world, if, the technolo if, if there was the technology to create a weapon like this. <clears throat> so I just thought I'd add in that very, very important plot point that, again, is the overall crux of Ra's al Ghul's plan to destroy Gotham City. <clears throat> so yeah, take that for what it is.